Welcome to our uh, meeting for today. This is a great uh, honor to have Martin Edwards with us. And Martin, you should know that actually we did a little survey last year about what people would like to see happen at our meetings since we can't just sit around and chat. <clears throat> and uh, have, learning more about the CWA was one of the top priorities for the group. Right, right. Well, uh, yeah. delighted to be with you. Happy to hear you talk about that, but also about your remarkable career as both a writer of mysteries and a writer of books about mysteries, the most recent being The Life of Crime, which has been uh, nominated for three awards, and also How Done It, a big, thick book I highly recommend, uh, which is a master class in crime writing with chapters by different members of the Detection Club. So welcome and Art, our interviewer today is one of our members. He's an associate professor of English at George Mason University in Virginia. And his latest book, it took me a minute to write the whole title down. <laughs> Short stories, which have been nominated for Edgar, Agatha, Anthony and McCavity Awards. They have won them. Did I say nominated? They've won them. And his latest book is The Adventures of the Castle Thief and Other Expeditions and Indiscretions, just out now. So welcome, Art and Martin, and I will now disappear and the story will go over to you. Thanks very much indeed. Yeah, uh, thanks to Alice and to Anthony for, uh, for hosting us here. Um, and for everybody for uh, showing up for this across many time zones. This is one of the reasons why we're doing this a little earlier. Uh, obviously, to accommodate there. Um, Martin and I have uh, known one another for a while. We were talking a little before the meeting began about uh, how long that's been. It was at BoucherCon that we've met and, of course, run each other at Malice Domestic, uh, too. Um, I have to admit, when I first met Martin, uh, he seemed like a very nice man. I did not realize at the time, though, uh, exactly the stature that he held, uh, both as a writer of crime fiction and as an authority on crime fiction. Uh, Alice already uh, gestured toward that a little bit, uh, toward the many awards, including the Diamond Dagger for Lifetime Achievement uh, from the CWA. Um, mentioned a couple of books. I'm going to hold them up because it lets me do a little bit of weightlifting. Uh, the Life of Crime uh, here. Uh, of course, is up for the Edgar and the Agatha. Alice mentioned a third award. What did I miss, Martin? Uh, it's the Crime Festival, the Harry Keating Award. Okay, and I appreciate your uh, on that. I've got How Done It here as well. I should have held that up in the other hand to keep my keep my <laughs> biceps, you know, evened out. Uh, and of course, as a novelist right now, is the fourth book in the series is coming out. I've got the three here uh, from the Rachel, and I hope I pronounce it correctly, Rachel Savanaki series. Wow. I, I would say Savonake, but uh, opinions Savonake. Savonake, I, I say. Yeah. Thank you so much. I've got the three uh, here. Uh, the fourth one, Sepulchre Street. Sepulchre Street is coming out in May in the UK. I do order uh, as soon as they come out uh, in the UK editions. I can't wait for the American editions to come out. They do have different titles in some cases. Um, as Alice also referred to, uh, Martin was the longest serving chair of the Crime Writers Association since its founder, John Creasy. In 2015, he was elected the eighth president of the Detection Club, and he is the archivist uh, for both organizations, as well as a consultant uh, to the British Library's Crime Classics uh, series. So whew, doing a lot in all directions. And I will add on a personal note, and I'll hold up another thing. Alice mentioned my collection. Martin wrote the introduction to that. And thank you so much again. Well, it's a, it's uh, for a that terrific set of it's a terrific set of stories, and it's a great pleasure. Well, it's really fun to be able to talk to you uh, today, yeah. and talk about something that we both uh, care about. I know this was advertised in a couple of different ways, uh, both as a discussion of short stories, short fiction, and also to talk about the CWA. We're going to touch on both of those and then go a little further. I, I do want to start with short stories, uh, though. Um, because in addition to the monumental works, both nonfiction and fiction you write, you're a terrific short story uh, writer uh, as well. So um, what is it about the short story as a form that you enjoy uh, as, as a reader first, but also as a writer? 
Well, thanks. Thanks, Art. And uh, it, it really is good to be with you and with everyone uh, today. It's been a long time since we met in person. We'll be putting that right uh, fairly soon. But uh, in the meantime, this is, this is great to have a chat right now. In, in terms of the appeal of short stories for me as a reader, I, I think, uh, well, it's partly to do with having a very short attention span. Uh, I, I like the, the idea of being able to read a story from start to finish in a short space of time. And of course, for what, maybe 80 years, the, the detective story was primarily uh, in the short form. The, the novels, uh, there were novels, but uh, uh, it was really only with the coming of the golden age that the novels uh, uh, largely took over. Short stories have been very important, uh, going all the way back to Edgar Allan Poe and the uh, Murders in the Rue Morgue, and they're still important, I think. And it it's partly that concentrated thing about a short story. You've got a limited word count, however long it may be, but it's limited. Every word has to count from the writer's point of view, but also from the reader's point of view. And, and so there's, there's no uh, time for padding the story out, uh, slack periods, uh, lack of pace development. You can't do that in a short story. So it's, uh, so it's a great uh, kind of caffeine rush uh, experience for me as, as a reader. And it's something I've, I've always loved. Uh, so, uh, so it began by loving short stories as a reader, and then uh, much later, much later, writing them as as well, which I I, I find endlessly fascinating. Yeah, from a writer perspective, you know, you talk about the need for compression, the need for to manage the pacing. I mean, there's a, a lot of things that, from a reader standpoint, are very satisfying. Is that a challenge uh, to you as a writer? Obviously, it's different to write the novels you're working on at that uh, uh, scope, that landscape, that span. Um, what are the challenges of the short form and what are the exciting aspects of that? I think there are quite a few challenges and quite a few exciting uh, features with writing short stories. Um, the, the first thing, it's going back to this point about every word has to count. Um, but more than that, you're very often dealing with a single idea, whereas a, a novel uh, is often uh, textured in a variety of different ways with layers of plot and character development and so on. You've got less space in a short story. So it, it, that concentrates your mind as a writer to focus on, on a few elements, whether it be character, may, maybe a twist, uh, uh, maybe a, something to do with the setting. Um, but, but you've really got to pack a lot into a short space. So that's a challenge, but, it, but it's also something that's, I think, very appealing. Um, and I've always felt that some ideas are essentially short story ideas. When I, when I have an idea for a, uh, an idea comes to me, Sometimes it will be something that feels like it, it might develop into a novel or a part of a novel. But other times it will be a single uh, ingredient which feels, yeah, I, I, I've, I've come to this place. I've, maybe I've gone on holiday, found, a, found a, a new setting I find really interesting uh, and appealing and enticing. And maybe I want to write about it. But it's not somewhere I know very well. And I wouldn't want to write a full length book about it, wouldn't have the expertise to do so. But a short story is, is a different kettle of fish. So, so some ideas I think uh, are naturally short story ideas. They, they come to you in, in one go and you think, great, that's it. With, with, with one story I, I, I wrote, um, it, it's a story that was lucky for me, it was one called Acknowledgements. And the idea was, I, I've been reading a number of books, which have at the end, and yeah, most of us do this, but uh, the, there was a particularly lengthy set of acknowledgements by the author at the end, and it, it did become rather tedious, as I dutifully read, read through it, uh, and, and slightly self-congratulatory as, as well. So I thought, why not 
write a short story that begins as the acknowledgements in a novel, but it turns into uh, a, a crime story. And so that, that was the idea. You couldn't do that in a novel, but for a, a short story, it was, it was perfect. And so that, it, it, it's this single, single shot, or maybe two shots sometimes, That because uh, uh, sometimes I'll get an idea that I think is a short story idea, and I, I can't quite make it work. And it requires another idea to germinate with it, to, to uh, uh, produce something that I think is, is worthy of, of writing. So for example, I, I, I did before the pandemic, I did some lecturing on the Queen Mary, very enjoyable. And whilst I was wandering around the ship, I, I saw something about the history of the ship that, that intrigued me. I thought I might write a short story about it, but I couldn't quite think of a way to make it work. I, I had the idea of the Queen Mary and the crime, but I, I couldn't quite make it, make it come alive. And then uh, Maxim Yakubowski, the uh, current chair of the CWA, he, he um, was putting together a, a locked room impossible crime anthology. Oh, what about a locked cabin on the Queen Mary? So those two things came together. So sometimes it's one idea, sometimes you need something else as well to make it work, uh, e even in something pretty sure. Um, you had mentioned acknowledgments, which was actually one of the next questions I was going to ask. Um, if I'm remembering, that was the first story to win the Marjorie Allingham yes. prize. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's such an interesting structure to the story. And um, and as you said, that's not something that could have been sustained at the 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 longer uh, in a longer narrative. Um, but do you think the short story itself is something? that lends itself to that kind of experimentation? Um, or maybe flip side of that, what is your interest in experimenting with form in the short story as opposed to the more strictly linear story? Or, Well, I, I am generally very interested in, in experimenting because I think that it's part of a bigger picture as a writer that I, I think it's good to keep yourself fresh and not, not doing the same old, same old. So if I pick up a, a magazine with a story by Art Taylor in it, I know it's going to be different from the last Art Taylor story I read, mm. because I, I think you do this constantly, Art, if I may say so. You're constantly trying something different, different approach. And that, that to me, is, is also very attractive. Uh, and it energises you as a writer. It keep, keeps readers on the toes. Um, and I like to do it with novels. I like to do it with novels in a series, whether it's the Rachel Savonake series or the Lake District mm -hmm. series or, or whatever. But of course, if you're experimenting with a novel, that, that there's a significant element of risk associated with that. Because yeah, if the experiment doesn't work, then you know, maybe two years uh, hard labour uh, down the drain. I'm, I'm writing a novel at the moment, which is absolutely an experiment. It's quite different from my previous crime fiction. It is a, it is a crime novel, uh, but I've no idea if, if it will work. No, nobody's read it, nobody's seen it. Um, I think the ingredients are great, but, but whether it'll work as a book, I just don't know. With short stories, uh, one of the great attractions, of course, is you can do all kinds of experiments. And you know, what's the worst that can happen? Yeah, yeah you, you write off a couple of weeks. So, so the investment of time is generally, not always, but generally much, much less. And so you can afford to do a whole variety of things that, you know, life being short, you wouldn't possibly be able to do with, with a comparable number of novels. So, so that chance to do something different is very, very appealing and very, very beneficial uh in in all kinds of ways not only in in keeping you fresh but giving you a break in terms of uh, a change of pace when you finish one novel before you start another for instance you, you may explore settings that you might want to explore in a novel so so when i was asked to write a, a rural novel uh ooh, probably about 2004 
my previous novels had all been set in cities, but I'd just written a short story set in uh, uh, the northwest of England, um, uh, close to the Lake District, not at the Lake District, and that gave me the confidence to come up with an idea for what turned out to be the first Lake District mysteries, mystery. And, and that series continues to this day, as, as you mentioned. So, so sometimes there can be knock-on benefits from short stories that, that you absolutely don't expect when you, when you write them. So there's a whole range of things about them that are very, very attractive, despite the challenges I mentioned. Uh, you, you've already touched on this a little bit with what you were just saying, but in terms of investing the time in a novel, investing the time in a short story, do you are is the short story the breaks between the novel? All of a sudden, you'll write some short stories, or as you're working on a novel, do you take a break from that process, write a short story, come back to it? How do you work the two? For me, predominantly, I, I write them between novels but sometimes I get an attractive request um, of some kind that uh, this happened a bit last year. Uh, uh, I, I was approached to write stories for particular anthologies that sounded very appealing. So I, I took a break from the novel I was writing, which was Sepulchre Street at the time. So, so one of them, uh, uh, a chap called Andy McAleer, uh, was putting together with colleagues of a book called Edgar and Seamus Gold Golden, which you're familiar with. Uh, and yes. I, he approached me. I thought, I'm busy with Sepulchre Street. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. Uh, I'm going to be, be firm. And then 24 hours later, I had an idea that I really liked. So, so, I, so I agreed to do it. I was glad I, I did it. There was another, uh, another book. Uh, I think you're you're very familiar with Paranoia Blues, edited by Josh Pachter. That was a tribute to Paul Simon. I'm a big fan of uh, uh, Paul Simon, so I, I couldn't resist that either. Uh, and uh, it, it's things like that. Maxim, I, I mentioned before, he he brought out a Cornell Woolrich uh, uh, mm -hmm. anthology, Black Is the Night. And I like Cornell Woolrich too, so I, I, I was tempted and succumbed uh, to temptation when I should have been writing my novel. So, <laughs> so there are exceptions to the principle, uh, uh, a combination of weak will on my part and, and the lure of the, uh, the enticing idea of uh, working with a good editor, uh, and doing something different that's appealing. So, so I don't have a firm discipline about. It. Good, I, and I appreciate you bringing some like show and tell materials as well. I was afraid I was the only one doing that, so uh, uh, I'm glad you did that. And and uh, Martin's kind of wink my way. We are both in the Edgar and Seamus Go Golden uh, anthology, um, and 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 Martin, we've got a another anthology coming out later this year. I think I think it's been delayed a little bit but uh, uh looking at Father Knox's rules of uh of the golden age detective yeah. rules and and what not to violate and and we're violating some rules together uh, in that absolutely. we are indeed we are indeed there are no rules uh so uh, so yeah so that 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 will be uh, that will be fun as well and Josh is bringing out an anthology of Beatles tribute stories so I've I've contributed a Beatles story about it so. oh nice nice uh, uh, she's which, leaving, which uh, song? She's leaving home. I, uh, I I I got an idea, so I I, I begged him to let me do do that uh, that particular song, that particular album. Very fun. Good, good. Well, we've talked a little bit about you as a reader and you as a writer, and of course, as you're holding up the anthologies here, you mentioned several editors. Needless to say, you are a distinguished editor of short story anthologies as well. Um, not only the ones that you've edited for the British Library, um, the classics there, uh, but also 19 anthologies for the CWA, including most recently Music of the Night. I should have grabbed that to hold that up. Um, and another four anthologies for regional CWA chapters. So I want to ask a little bit about your work as an editor, which I guess is another form of being a reader. 
Um, you, you look at historical stories, which you're doing for the British crime series, crime library series, versus the ones being written today. What do you see as the uh, differences? Where has the form changed or evolved or has it? It, it, it has evolved. Um, I think that um, it, it's evolved stylistically, but also in terms of content. Um, but I think that just as there are great stories, most definitely in the past, uh, there are great stories being written now. It's just that I think that there's more of a focus probably on characterization now. Uh, than, than there was, uh, if we go back to the golden age, I think that sometimes there's a focus on social issues that, that was not significant um, 80, 80 years ago. Um, there are relatively few uh, what you might call pure detective stories. There are some, uh, but but then it was always the case that the uh, the golden age who done it uh, template, if you like, was better suited to the novel than the short story. There, yeah, and there are reasons why, on the whole, Agatha Christie's short stories weren't at the same level as uh, novels. And the exceptions uh, tended to be stories that weren't conventional who done it, stories like Witness for the Prosecution and Accident and so on, which, mm -hmm. which are in many ways quite modern. In, in their approach to the storytelling craft. So, so I, I think that the, the whodunit in its classic form is, is generally better suited to the novel where you've got more space to hide all the clues and, and all that. The, the short, sharp shock of the short story, he said very alliteratively, is, uh, is, is something that plays better with character in a single twist rather than multiple twists. If you're um, obviously a reader on the one hand, editor on the other, if you're reading, you're not selecting. If you're editing, you've got to make a judgment about what story might find its way into an anthology and what one would be put aside. Uh, what are you looking for when you pick up a submission? What is likely to draw you in, hook you, keep you reading? Is it is it character? Is it plot? Is it prose? Is it of course, the, the glib answer is that you're, you're looking for really good stories, the best. But, but for me, that there's more to it than that, because what you're looking for as an editor of an anthology, I think, is a bit different from the mindset you have as a reader, or certainly that I have as a reader uh, of anthologies. Because what I'm looking for as an editor is to produce a book and my idea with, with an anthology is that it should be pretty diverse. As eclectic as the uh, concept allows, I'm, I'm, I'm generally very keen on anthologies with themes. I think anthologies that are just a disparate collection of short stories uh, tend to have less appeal to me, with some notable exceptions. Um, I, I, I like there to be a connecting theme. And that's generally been the case with the overwhelming majority of anthologies, both the British Library ones and the contemporary ones, the ones that I've edited. And so if you're looking at a theme, you're looking for different takes on that theme, different styles, different ways of approaching the theme. Sometimes writers embracing the theme, sometimes only just glancing at it uh, uh, and of course you get submissions where they don't even glance at it at all which which isn't so good um, because because ultimately the part of the marketing of the book is is the theme so you, so you want in some way that theme to be reflected but what it means for me is that um, having that variety means that sometimes you can have a number of stories that are very good, but they're quite similar. And that will sometimes be a difficulty 
in the editorial process because you think this story is great, this story is great, this story is great, but yeah, they're all they're all basically about one spouse killing another and there's, there's a twist and it's a bite a bit story or something like that, uh, or they're all set in um, uh, on a Scottish island. Uh, yeah, you've got four Scottish island stories for, for no particular reason. It's just just the way things work out, and so. Because I am quite wedded to the idea of variety, um, I, I will sometimes um, prefer a story that, that may grab me less than, than one of the stories that was very similar to some of the others. So it's, quality comes into it, but it, it's not the only issue. It, it's a question of, of range. Because one of the things that is very striking to me about anthologies, and you see it in reviews, I think, constantly, is that different readers like different things. And in an anthology, you will see one uh, person thinking, you know, I, I like such and such, and I couldn't bear such and such. And then somebody else will say the exact opposite. And all the shades of gray in between those two extremes. And that I think is fine, uh, as, as long as all the stories, uh, you hope, uh, will have some appeal to, to some readers. The fact that readers prefer some to others, for me, is not a problem. In fact, what I'm aiming to do very often, both with the historical ones, the classic crime ones, and with the contemporary ones, is have not just a mix of styles, but also you'll have one or two very well-known authors, you know, mm -hmm. maybe the big names that go on the cover, something like that, but also some very unfamiliar uh, names as well. I think that's attractive. And then some uh, uh, people who've been around quite a while, but, but may not be as well-known as they deserve to be, plenty of writers fit that description. So I like to have a mix of different types of contributor as well. That, that variety seems to me to be very important. Of course, it's particularly gratifying uh, with some of the contemporary books when you, you pick a, uh, a, a relatively unknown author and then they go on to become, uh, some years later, hugely successful. And, and uh, you think, well, yeah, I, 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 I did see, I, I did see that that was somebody with, with great potential. It's exciting to see it being realised. So, and that's one of the gratifying things about editing over a period of years, that that, that does happen. Uh, and I, I do find that very rewarding, I must say. Yeah, I'm not to put you on the spot, but are there a couple of folks to shout out who you saw early in their careers and have gone on as a short story in an anthology? And oh yes, yes, quite quite a number. I mean, the the very first CWA anthology I edited was a book called Perfectly Criminal. Um, it's it's on the shelves um, behind me, and um, I I did introductory notes uh, with that particular. Uh, book and there was a writer I'd, I'd only just met him but I'd been reading him for a number of years a young writer I had an interesting correspondence with him he's living in France uh, and he was a terrific writer but but he was very frustrated because he wasn't getting through uh, and and so I asked him to write a short story and I I, I boldly said in in my introductory spiel I, I felt this was a writer of great potential and uh, that story actually went on to win a dagger and the following year the young gifted author won the gold dagger and if I tell you his name was and is Ian Rankin uh, you'll see that uh, he certainly he certainly fulfilled all his potential and more because he's he's fantastic but it my point is that he was fantastic in those early days, his early books. Yes, of course, he's developed and improved as, as we all try to do, uh, uh, but, but he was a good writer to begin with. Um, uh, more recently, Mick Heron, 
Uh, I published one of his very first stories, and of course, he's now uh, a superstar, and deservedly so. So, so these things, Sarah Hillary is is another uh, example. So, so these things, as I say, are very gratifying uh, when when it when it actually happens for the author in question, and um, and you feel a kind of vicarious joy uh, because of it. I should have mentioned this earlier. If uh, folks do have questions they'd like to add, uh, please do put them in the chat. I'll be watching the chat. Um, we're going to talk for just a couple more quick questions about short stories, then I'll move on to talking more about the CWA. Um, but if anybody does have questions, be sure and and, and add them there. Um, two last questions on short stories. Uh, one is, uh, you know, the, there are, of course, writers in this group and many folks who are novel writers, but I've often found that people who are writing novels are struggling with a short story or some folks trying a short story for the first time. Suggestions that you might have for people that are trying the short story form for the first time. What kind of advice would you give a couple of pieces? I think as ever with, with writing, don't force it. But if, if you find that single idea that you don't necessarily uh, want to turn into a novel. Experiment with a short story and see how it goes. May, may, maybe try writing it in a couple of different ways. Um, do something a bit different, uh, unfamiliar. Uh, what's the worst that can happen? Um, so experiment, try different things. I, I jot down all sorts of ideas and some of them never get written and some of them only get half written. Um, I've half written a story uh, just before Christmas that uh, uh, was destined for an anthology, and then I ran out of ran out of time. So that happens, but but it's worth having a go. You've nothing to lose, and you may actually find that it's a great experience. Good, good. And a couple of maybe favorite short stories that you have, classic or contemporary, that you might recommend to folks, uh, either just for for good reading. Uh, or maybe as a, a a model to look at for inspiration for? Well, a very famous one I'm very keen on is um, The Lottery by Shirley Jackson. That's, that's one of my all-time favourites. There's a wonderful American writer uh, called Frederick Brown. I'm a big fan of Frederick Brown. And he wrote a fantastic story called Don't Look Behind You, which uh, uh, made a great impression on me when I read it. And it, it's a gimmicky idea. Of, of the kind I do like a lot. Uh, and But Frederick Brown wrote a lot of terrific short stories and, and some very good novels as well. So Frederick Brown, I recommend. Uh, again, uh, one of the great contemporary writers, uh, Peter Lovesy, uh, wrote a terrific story called You Done It, uh, which again, like Frederick Brown, is a, is a clever gimmicky idea. And Peter's uh, someone who's experimented endlessly and with enormously successful results. So, so I, I think those would be three I would definitely recommend. Good, good. I, I know two of them. I don't know the Frederick Brown, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be looking that one up this weekend uh, to try it out. And I don't know if you know this, but Peter is also going to be in the same anthology, the Father Knox anthology that, that uh, we're doing. So, And I've read his piece for that. I've read your story for that. It's going to be fun. Fun ahead. Yeah. I want to talk about the CWA a little bit. As Alice said, um, a lot of folks, we are a, a relatively new chapter here, the North American chapter, um, still building membership, still spreading the word. Um, you, on the other hand, have been with the CWA for a long time, um, you know, as a member, uh, of course, as the chair as well. Uh, what has the CWA meant to you uh, as, as a writer at different stages of your career? Well, you, you may be interested to know, given, given uh, what we've been talking about, that my first um, awareness of the CWA came through an anthology. Um, I saw it in a shop um, when I was 12, 12 years old, I think, something like that. And I asked for it as a Christmas present, and it was a CWA anthology. And I, I read on the jacket about this mysterious organisation of crime writers. Uh, uh, who, who met and socialised. I thought this was absolutely a wonderful concept. Um, uh, and it was called John Creese's Mystery Bedside Book. And I, I duly received that book as a Christmas present. I still have it upstairs. Um, and, um, and I loved reading it. 
And so I learned about the CWA from that anthology. And because even at that tender age, I was very clear that was the life I wanted to have as a crime writer. I always had it in mind that as soon as I could, I would like to be part of this mysterious but wonderful organisation. And in fact, I, I became a member in 1987, which um, uh, uh, very assiduous researchers will notice before my first novel was published, that I'd written about crime fiction and I got in on the strength of, of that by the skin of my teeth, uh, uh, really. But, um, and I've, I've always felt that a degree of uh, flexibility and judgment in, in looking at membership criteria is, is a good thing. So I certainly benefited from that. And shortly after that, I received uh, a letter from somebody called Peter Walker, um, who was setting up the Northern chapter of the Crime Writers Association. And at this point, I hadn't met crime writers. And I was very excited. I, I went uh, along, I drove along to Borough Bridge in, in Yorkshire, the very same hotel where many years later I met Anthony, who's uh, doing all the wonderful organisation for, for this event. Uh, it's the same place. And um, I was very nervous. I went with my, my then uh, girlfriend, late, later Mrs Edwards, uh, she recalls how nervous I was at meeting all the great writers. Uh, and um, it was a small group, but it was a group that included Peter Walker, who later had a hugely successful TV series called Heartbeat, based on his books. Uh, Robert Barnard, Diamond Dagger winner, eight Edgar nominations, a uh, terrific guy, his wife, Peter and his wife, and Reginald Hill, another Diamond Dagger winner, uh, and his wife. And... and the thing that I remember very vividly was they're all very pleasant and very kind and supportive to somebody they'd never heard of, uh, understandably. Uh, and, and that support and friendship meant a huge amount to me. And uh, it, it's been a conspicuous feature of uh, the CWA. In my experience of the CWA, I think it's a great part of the CWA's ethos, this this encouragement and, and mutual support. Because writing, right, we all know this, writing is a tough game. It has its ups and downs. It has a lot of downs sometimes. So the mutual support is, is really valuable. And, and so my involvement with it, my, my awareness of CWA goes back to my, my early days, but I've, I've been quite closely involved for over 30 years, and it's, it's been absolutely wonderful. I mean, you talk about the, the kind of the friendships, the, the welcoming nature of these folks who are very well established with long yeah. careers. You're on the flip side uh, now of that. Um, you know, why uh, is it those experiences? How do those experiences inform what seems to be your interest in and passion about giving back to younger writers, giving to a literary community, giving to the CWA in particular? What's the connection between all that? What motivates you there? Oh, it, it's a very it's a very strong connection, Art, because I say I, I do remember uh, that kindness and support very vividly. Um, when I finally uh, wrote a sh short story, I, I I went to a a, a writer's seminar. It was a competition uh, run by a national magazine, and my my short story won the competition. And one of the speakers at the seminar happened to be Bob Barnard. He recommended it to. Eleanor Sullivan, who was then the editor at Ellery Queen. So that story, my first short story, finished up not in, just in the British magazine, but also in Ellery Queen's magazine. And it wouldn't have done so without Bob's support. I'm sure about that. Um, so things like that really mean a lot. And you remember them. Uh, Reginald Hill, who's a fantastic writer, one of the best in my book, Beyond the Dow, but very, very supportive. He and I uh, were uh, spent a lot of time together in, back in the 90s. He asked me to help him uh, on a subcommittee to do the Diamond Dagger. And he said, yeah, it's a long way off for you, but, but you know, 
one of these days and I thought oh, he's just being kind but um you know you never know what what will happen so things like that stay in the mind and um when you see uh young writers I particularly don't like it when young writers become upset because of the struggle uh mm. which is not uncommon we'll we'll uh, know that and we've all been there uh but I I think anything you can do to encourage people not to give up is is really important and so that is my uh persistent message don't don't give up things things will get better but they only get better if you stay in the game you've got to give it a chance to get better in terms of inspiration in terms of affirmation uh we talked at the beginning about Obviously, the diamond dagger that you have received as well, the number of awards for individual works too. Um, you know, how do awards uh, uh, help to, maybe a, a silly question given that you have a well-established career, but how do they help to, to keep you motivated, keep you moving, um, or what's your attitude toward that? Is it, is it, thank you so much, I appreciate it, or is it like, all right, I'm on the right track, or or with the lifetime achievement, well, now I'm done. I can just stop. <laughs> no chance of that. Um, I, it's, an, it's a really interesting question. Um, my, my first book was nominated for the John Creasy Ward Dagger, uh, the best first novel, won by Walter Mosley, uh, as I had the chance to point out to him many years later at the Eggers uh, when he was Grand Master. Uh, devil in a blue dress um, and um, that was very gratifying but things were very different in those days so different that I didn't even know that the book had been nominated until I went into a bookshop run by Maxim Jakubowski and he told me it was the first I knew about it yeah there was no announcement so I got in touch with um, somebody else who's spoken about, Peter Lovesy, who was the chair at the time, and said, is this true? He said, yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, may maybe we should have announced it. So, so there was an announcement, so I finally, finally saw it in black and white. Um, so things were very different then. And it, but but that, that bit of recognition meant a great deal to me. Um, but although I had one or two nominations uh, my yeah my first novel was 91 um i i won an award the short story dagger in 2008 so i've been writing as a published crime writer of 17 years mm. a long a long time yeah more than half my career uh so uh that early nomination gave me some some uh, degree of boost to the morale and and i do think that this is this is the value of, of these things because yeah we, we can always argue about the, the judgments that are made with who's nominated who's shortlisted who's longlisted who wins or all that it, it it is and always has been and always will be uh, a, a matter of opinion but of course, if if you're fortunate enough, and, and you know this very well, Art, you, you, you've won many awards and have many nominations, that recognition is, is gratifying in itself. And it is gratifying. And it's gratifying to be shortlisted, let alone to win. That's for sure. But I also myself feel, I, I, I don't know whether, whether you may feel the same, I think that time passes you get in, embroiled with your next book and it may not be going so well you may get a bad review or, or whatever you may fall out with your publisher or something like that what, whatever it is th there's some kind of setback because that is that is how the writing life often goes and then I do think it is it is motivating and reassuring to look back on what you've done and think well yeah um that yeah I, I reached a certain standard uh that was good uh that that degree of recognition and that is very valuable for me as a boost to my confidence and morale because these things are very fragile with I think with most writers really 
uh, certainly with me, uh, and, and the reminders that, that you've done things that have worked, uh, tangible reminders, is, is for me actually really important. I am quite... I am quite materialistic about it. Yeah, I, I, I have these, these awards where, in places where I can see them if I want to see them. I have the, you know, the scrolls or, or whatever it may be. Uh, and, and if I, I feel a need for uh, renewed confidence, I'll have a look at them uh, to remind me it did actually happen. It wasn't just a dream. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, and uh, I, I, I do know what you mean. You know, it seems like each short story, the next... The next blank page is, is a hill to be climbed, uh, no matter what. Um, you talked a little bit, uh, obviously, about having come to the CWA first by writing about uh, crime fiction as opposed to writing crime fiction yourself, having become a member in that way. Uh, you're now the archivist, I think still the archivist, both for the CWA and for the Detection Club. That has continued as well. Um, which brings us a, a little bit to the life of crime here. And of course, um, to the previous book, uh, The Golden Age of Murder, winner of both the Edgar and the Agatha and other awards um, as well. Uh, tell us a little bit about your research um, generally, particularly for the new book, the scope of it. And I know you were building uh, specifically a little bit with awareness, at least, of uh, Julian Simon's bloody murder um, as like, this is this is something new, something different, building in that tradition. Tell us a little bit about, about your, your goals for the book and your research for it. Well, well, talking about, you know, the people you know through the crime writing community, and through the CDB, Andrew Taylor, a, a very fine writer, a very good man, uh, 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 someone I, I respect hugely. We were, we were at a festival back in the 90s, and he, he said to me, he said, you yeah, know, really, Martin, you ought to write a new bloody murder and it's only this bit like reg hill and talking about the damn day oh, i could never do that but similarly it lodged in my mind uh, and, and andrew remembers that conversation as, as well uh uh full enough all these years later uh and um the golden age of murder as, as you say did, did did well much better than i'd ever dreamed so i thought at last there was an opportunity to tackle this this crazy project of trying to cover uh, the whole of crime fiction across the world, across the time. Uh, and um, of course, the, the first question is, well, what, what do you leave out? Well, the short answer is, however big the book, you leave out a lot of stuff. Um, so, um, so you've got to be selective. So, of course, I've been reading crime fiction consistently since I was eight years old. So you know, I've, I've read a lot of books and short stories. So that helps. Um, I, I have a, a large collection there taking over the house, uh, much to the dismay of Mrs. Edwards, it has to be said. Uh, and um, uh, that continues to literally to this day, more books have arrived, uh, which I'm very happy about. Um, so then it was a question of, of researching, researching the lives of, of individual writers, because I was concerned that if I was taking on a very big topic, it could easily become a sort of dry encyclopedia. And I wanted to write a book that people would read from start to finish. Maybe not in one sitting, uh, as that, that would be a very big ass, but uh, and maybe in chunks, or, or they might dip into it. Uh, you can read the book in a variety of ways. So I wanted to use, as I had done with The Golden Age of Murder, novelistic techniques to try to make all the information come alive. I, I'd assembled the information, I'd read the books, I knew, knew the material fairly well, but it's how you tell it. And so the idea I hit on was each chapter would start with a little vignette from the life of a particular writer might be a famous writer, might be somebody less well known. Um, uh, but that would be a starting point, lead off into a discussion of that writer's work, but also related work. Um, and furthermore, uh, each chapter would have end notes, which are not just footnotes. I had a long discussion with a copy editor who's obsessed with footnotes. 
uh, and wanted footnotes in every page, which I very much didn't want. Um, and that was one battle I did. I did fight to the bitter end, uh, I, I must say, because I was very clear in my mind about what the concept would be, that you can read the chapter, you can ignore the, the end notes, but you can come back to them. And the end notes go off at all sorts of tangents because there's a lot of stuff uh, that doesn't fit easily into any sort of chronological narrative or the narrative of individual writers' lives. But I wanted to pack in as much as I could. And you know, the book's a quarter of a million words, so there's a lot of, lot of stuff in there. And the end notes were very, very important to me as a way of introducing quite a lot of supplementary material that I found fun and interesting and, and little snippets, anecdotes, whatever it might be, that all went together, that supplemented the main narratives and the overall narrative of how crime writing has developed. So that uh, in the end, it, it became a book that I hope people can However, they they like to read it, whether they dip in, whether they read it chapter by chapter, or whether they read the end notes as well, they can come back to it. The indexes are very important. Uh, they can use the indexes and use it, but not just as a reference to. I, I think of it as more than uh, a reference work. I think of it as a, a story containing a whole lot of smaller stories. That so that was my approach to it. Um, I'll admit how I'm reading it. Uh, it. It had been sitting on my desk for a while, and then I noticed that it had 55 chapters, and I thought there are 52 weeks in a year. So I'm actually, it's, it's my little treat on Friday afternoon, and at some point I'm going to need to fit in an extra chapter, obviously, but I read read one chapter a week, just kind of have a little bit of fun. The footnotes are fascinating, but I, I did, I'm probably going to pronounce his name wrong, but I, I, I love uh, the chapter on early spy fiction, Erskine Childers, did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, yeah. The fact that, as you you say, you start out with him in front of a firing squad, which I had not known about him. I've talked about Riddle of the Sands in my own spy fiction classes, but I had not researched. But that was a grabber, and I think that you do that very nicely, uh, chapter to chapter in this. And yeah, I'm enjoying the book. I would advise people to read it in that way. That's a looking at, and I'm, I'm watching our time a little bit. I want to make sure we do have time for the questions. But as a segue between the research that you're doing um, and your own writing a little bit, I want to talk uh, quickly about Mortmain Hall. I'll hold that up again. This is the second book um, in the in the new series. And when that came out, you and I talked briefly about the fact that you start with the epilogue. And at the end of the book, you have a clue finder. And, and in both cases that we talked about, I thought, well, this is novel. And you said, oh, no, no. The epilogue is something at the beginning is something that's been done before historically. The clue finder is in, in what ways does a study of the history of mystery inform your work as a fiction writer as well? Well, yeah, so it's, it's a subject that does interest me greatly, Art. Um, with my very first novel, All Lonely People, I, I, I had the idea, set in Merseyside, Liverpool, I had the idea of a body being discovered on an industrial waste heap. Uh, which I thought was, a, you know, there lots of social resonances there, and it's very original and cutting edge in the, well, it was late 1980s when I actually wrote that. Um, and then many years later, I discovered somebody had done exactly the same thing in the 1930s. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's very, true originality is very, very, very difficult, despite what publishers say in blurbs about this you know, totally original story. It rarely is. But that doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's what you do with the concept, even if it's been used before. You, you do it in a, in a fresh way. The epilogue at the start, there's a writer called Philip MacDonald had, had done that. The American writer called uh, C. Daly King had done it. Um, but but I, I thought of a new way to do it in, in a book that is set in the golden age and is full of golden age uh, ingredients, but, but has a kind of darker modern psychological sensibility. And so doing something fresh with very familiar tropes was, was very appealing to me, but also doing it as a, 
fair play mystery and using the clue finder device, which was quite popular in the late 20s and the 30s, uh, but hadn't been done for a very, very long time. I'm now delighted that the clue finders are starting to pop up again. That's, that's terrific. Uh, and, and I think it's for anybody who likes a fair play mystery, the clue finder is a good discipline uh, for the author to guess you've got to justify uh, yourself because you've got to show where the clues were put in the text and just hope that the reader didn't spot them. You want to talk a little bit about genre as well. Um, you mentioned fair play mystery. You mentioned in many ways that the, the, uh, these books build on the tradition of the golden age uh, mystery. But at the same time, we've got some gothic in there. We've definitely got some noir in there. We've got a kind of heroine that we might not have seen um, in some of those earlier books. I'm teaching a course right now called Crossing Genres at Mason. In, in what ways are you drawing on different traditions, different genres? What is your interest in that direction? I'm very interested in it, uh, in, in short. And, and the, the idea of these gothic -y elements and the noirish elements, the, the, um, I'll, I'll let you into a secret. Uh, I'll let everybody into a secret about Sepulchre Street. Sepulchre Street, the fourth book in the series, um, there are many components to the story because the, the, this series, the, the, the storylines are quite, quite elaborate. Um, but one component which started Sepulchre Street in my mind was a, a, a storyline that has always fascinated me. And the most famous example, although it wasn't the first, uh, and it's mentioned in, in The Light of Crime, is a great book and great film called The Big Clock by Kenneth mm. Fairman. Uh, right, film noir, uh, and this idea of the uh, uh, guy who's tasked with solving the murder mystery, but he's actually the the guilty person or the suspect, uh, and that that's been done in a variety of ways. And I had an idea for uh, applying that to my series, but having Jacob Flint, the journalist, as the as the patsy, the the guy who's who's got to find. Uh, uh, a villain, but but it's actually himself, uh, and so that was the starting one. Now, now those scenes uh, really come in halfway through the book. There's a, there's a lot of other stuff going on, but the big cut, the, the film noir thing, was was the actual starting point for that particular golden age style novel. So these influences they they come from different directions. But I, I think it's fun to see what what different things you can do with them. You take them in a different direction and see see what happens. And that's I find that really, really enjoyable and, and rewarding uh, as a writer. Terrific. Um, we are at the top of the hour. I will emphasize that word top of the hour, whatever hour you are in right now, since we're in different time zones. So I do want to make sure we have some time uh, for questions from the audience. I do have a, a, a couple other questions myself, but there have been two that popped up in the chat. Um, coming back to short stories, uh, Scott Daniels asked, can you recommend any mystery crime stories that have an element of the supernatural? And he said, perhaps ones by Peter Lovesey. Scott and I talked the other day about the Haunted Crescent uh, by, by Lovesey. So, but are there others you might might recommend? Um, I, I don't, I mean, I think, that there's one of the Peter Diamond novels that has, is it The Vault, that has nods to um, Mary Shelley and Frankenstein, if I remember rightly. Uh, so not a short story, uh, but, but that, that's a good, good novel in a very good series. So The Vault might be worth uh, uh, taking a look at. Um, I, I think using the supernatural uh, in some way, and it, I, it, in this book I'm writing at the moment, the experiment, that has more of the supernatural in it than any of my previous books. And I'm finding that interesting uh, to do. Uh, as I say, it's, it, it is an experiment, so uh, it remains to be seen if, if it will um, get anywhere. But, but, but the supernatural, the gothic, uh, the, 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 the horrific to some extent can can play a part in, in a, a really good crime story, short or long. Uh, some of the short stories in the British classics uh, 
and classics anthologies uh, verge on uh, 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 the uh, supernatural or the horrific. Um, so uh, crossover, I'm I'm very interested in, and one of the reasons is because I'm not a believer. As I, I think I make pretty clear in the life of crime, I'm not a believer in strict definitions. Um, lawyers, and I, I am a I am a lawyer. Uh, uh, lawyers love definitions, but uh, I think when you're talking about fiction, um, it, it's much more flexible, and and I think that labels genres and subgenres are helpful for libraries and bookshops and publishers but i think for writers it can become a bit of a constraint a trap you know in in there you, you feel constrained and i think that's something to be avoided and i think it's good to feel liberated uh, when it comes to moving around in terms of what sort of uh, story you're writing all right we got a question from kate jackson uh, do you believe exercising the muscles required for brevity in short form helps you when pacing full length novels? I think this is a fascinating question. I, I often tell people that they are two different movements. The short story is a, is a matter often of subtraction, you know, take out what doesn't need to be there, where a novel is more characters, addition of subplots and things. But how do you think that, that the brevity required exercises those muscles that help with the full length novel? Well, I, I think economy of of writing is always um attractive um I, i'm not someone who is particularly keen on padding i, I, I like value uh, i like value as a reader i like to try to give value as as a writer i think that's that's important uh and yeah that's why the rachel Safnay books have a lot of stuff going on because i'm like yeah i, I, I like that uh, uh, from a writer's and a reader's perspective. I think that um, it is an interesting question. And I think I would say that for me, the experience of writing concisely economically in a short story becomes particularly relevant with a novel when you get to the stage of revision, uh, which I think is a very, very important stage you know all, all my books believe it or not are endlessly endlessly revised fact or fiction they're endlessly revised the life of crime went through a zillion different versions believe uh, and it, uh, my, my novels too go through numerous different incarnations even before i send them off uh, to my agent um so i think when it comes to revision very often revision is a process of cutting back this is where the subtraction comes in, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. it, it's very true in short fiction, but it's also true in many novels that less is more. And so there are bits that you want to take out if they're not really contributing. Uh, that, you know, that, that really evocative half page that doesn't actually take you anywhere. Uh, yeah, probably better let it go. Uh, so that is the way that I think I personally see the connection. It, it, it's more relevant at the stage of revising the novel rather than during the course of writing the novel for me. Okay. Um, this kind of leads me because uh, we're talking a little bit about craft here, some craft questions. I want to hold up again, uh, Hal Dunnett. Um, the subtitle of this, and I, I love the design on it, the fingerprint yeah, here. Yeah, it's okay. The subtitle, A Masterclass in Crime Writing by Members of the Detection Club. Um, terrific essays in here. This is not one that I've read start to finish. It is one that I have dipped into at times um, to, to get a perspective on some aspect of craft. I'm curious what you might have learned from editing this, anything that stood out to you as like, ah, that's an idea I hadn't thought about, or this is something that inspires me in another direction. It was a, it was a terrific joy to put that book together. I, I expected it to be quite a slim volume because the idea was to raise money for the detection club to keep it going. And so nobody's getting any payment. Uh, you got busy people, 
and I was blown away by the generosity of the contributors and, and indeed the, the agents, the estates of the deceased member uh, uh, who, who uh, contributed. And so the book got bigger and bigger to its current uh, uh, stately uh, size. And as the material came in, uh, I, I was blown away, say, by the generosity of those, those writers but also by the variety of opinions that um, I was edit I'd conceived the book and I was editing it, but some writers have diametrically opposed views. And I didn't see it as my task to reconcile those views. I was writing connecting sections to, to make the whole book work as a, as a, as a single piece. But uh, or was a series of pieces as well. But I didn't see it as my job to say to one great writer over there, well, actually, this, this person's right and you're wrong. I don't see it like that at all. I thought it's more interesting to present the contrasting views because nobody's got a monopoly of wisdom. So you get some people who talk about writer's block and others who think it doesn't exist. You get some people who, who plan and outline and some who think that's crazy uh, and, uh, and everything in between. So I, I suppose it was a reminder, firstly, that there are many different ways of writing and you have to figure out what works for you. But I, I was, I suppose uh, some of the well, one of the very first pieces I received, I think the second piece I received was Anne Cleves on human geography. I found that very interesting, the connection between landscape where she's she's so gifted and and character and and how certain stories fit a particular setting. I think this again is true of short stories, but it's also true of novels, and Anne's a good example of that. So I thought that was. That was very interesting. Uh, Mark Billingham comparing the uh, crime writer to the stand-up comic, and he's been both. Uh, that that how you deliver the punchline, that that sort of thing. So all these little little pieces, little bits of wisdom, uh, I, I found um, whether or not I agreed with them, I found very um, insightful and and at the very least thought provoking. Okay. Good, good. I will recommend the book highly uh, in addition uh, to Life of Crime and, and to the novels as well. We've got a question from Alice. Uh, can you say briefly what the Detection Club is and how it's related to the CWA? Two completely different organizations, yes? Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. The CWA is a professional organization. And if you're eligible for membership, you're eligible uh, and you should join. Um, the Detection Club um, predates the CWA. I think it's the oldest uh, organization. It predates the MWA. Uh, it was founded in 1930 uh, by Anthony Barclay, uh, alias Francis Isles. Um, and his idea was to create this little elite dining club. It began with a series of dinners at his home and turned it into a club. First president was G.K. Chesterton. And the idea was that people would because of course in those days there's no Twitter, there's no Facebook, writers didn't know each other at all. Uh, so they met and they were looking to elevate the standards of writing in the genre. So they were very picky about who they would allow to join. So no thriller writers at all, no Edgar Wallace, nothing like that. Um, not even John Bucker, incredible. Uh, so uh, it became less elitist, uh, but it's always remained essentially a small dining club and it would cease to have any meaning if, if it became large. So it, it's a relatively small group of people, one or two new members each year. There's about 60 uh, members uh, at, at any one time, roughly. Um, and, and it's a fun thing, but it, it, all it is is a is a social group like, like a chapter of the CWA. Um, and um, it, I, th I think the great thing about it is it's got this wonderful history, this heritage, because it was 
the first and and you know Christie and Sayers and John Dixon Carr they were all uh that they're all very active members and that that collegiality has uh, has continued and and was absolutely evidenced by the collegiality of all the contributors uh who who uh, uh, offered something to how done it all right. Um, one more question uh, before we kind of bring this to a close. Um, we've obviously given a lot of attention to your most recent series, uh, the new book, uh, Sepulchre Street, coming out in May. Um, but you're also, you know, recently after a kind of a six year, I don't want to call it a hiatus, but a, after a six year um, uh, gap, returned to the Lake District series with the Crooked Shore that was published in the U.S. by the girl they all forgot. You're also talking about the new book, which sounds like it's not related to either series, if I'm understanding correctly. Uh, tell me about what's, uh, what's, you know, what drew you back to the Lake District Mysteries, if you're going to continue that series, and maybe give us a little bit of a preview, if you feel like it, about the new book uh, that you're working on. The, um, the Lake District series is fun to do, um, but as I mentioned much earlier, I'm, I'm always interested in doing fresh things and keeping energized. So I like variety. I like doing different things. And even within the Lake series, the uh, say the seventh book, The Dungeon House, is very different from the earlier ones. And The Crooked Shore is different again in, in a variety of ways. And I'm always trying to do something different. And uh, uh, I'd always intended to write another Lakes book, in fact, several. Uh, but yeah, the Golden Age of Murder came along and Life of Crime, British Library, all that kind of thing. Um, and I'm not, a, I'm not actually a very fast novelist. I can write nonfiction much faster than I can write fiction. Uh, so it takes me quite a while to write a novel. So I have to, uh, and, and I don't like to have loads of deadlines reaching into the future or long contracts. So, so I tend to wait till, till I'm ready for something. And I spent a long time trying to figure out a, a fresh setting in the lakes uh, because e each book is set in a different part of that, that area. And then I finally found something which I fictionalised and called The Crooked Shore on the south coast of Cumberland. Uh, and, and it's a book I was very, 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 very happy with. Um, very happy with it indeed. Um, and that without giving away the ending, there's, there's a sort of... Uh, um wrapping up of something in in that book that's been a feature of the series from the very first book a feature when i didn't have any idea how it was going to be resolved but it's resolved in the eighth book the crooked shot so i think that when i return to the lakes i and i i, I will um i think i'm going to make another change of, of some kind. I don't know what it will be, but today I read that Cumbria County Council has been abolished with effect from today. And it's now mm -hmm. split into Cumberland and Westmoreland to two new local authorities, going back to the way things were 50 years ago and, and before then, the historical county, more or less. But, and that's happened today. So, and that, when I read that story this morning, that's interesting. Um, and there's something there that appeals to me. I don't know what I will make of it, but uh, because of course, the Lake District series is a cold case series, so it's reaching back into the past anyway. Daniel's a historian, Hannah is a cold case detective. But there's something in that news item that makes me think, yeah, there's there's a new direction there. I just need to let it let it simmer till till uh, that idea develops uh, an exciting life. Uh, but but when or what that will be, I, I, I don't yet know. The new book uh, is uh, what can I say about it? It's a book about the book world, and it is set in my native county that where where I live, where I'm speaking to to from now it's set in Cheshire. There are very, very few books set in Cheshire, very few uh, crime novels for sure. Uh, and it's high time that was put right. So that's, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm very, very devoted 
uh, to my home county. I think it's a great place. Uh, and um, I, I've introduced this element of the, uh, the supernatural and also the fact that Cheshire's on the border with Wales. So uh, different country, different traditions, all that. So that's, that's all part of this story, but it's new characters and it's, it's quite different from my other books. So, um, so I hope somebody will like it, but, uh, but time will tell. Well, um, sure, many of us are looking forward to it. I know I am uh, always whenever there's a new book coming out. Uh, I try to be first in line to get it, but I'm on the other side of the Atlantic. So it's like like 10th in line, maybe or 100th in line or 1000th in line, but we'll be looking for it. Thanks and this me. has been a real pleasure uh, chatting me with too. you today, Martin. Me too. Thanks uh, so much. I think Alice is going to come uh, back on uh, and do an official kind of thank you as well. Um, but uh, but oh, uh, one as she's coming back on one little sneak in, uh, Jeff Pierce uh, from the Rap Sheet uh, asked yeah. if the new standalone is a contemporary story or a historical. So a quick follow up there. Hello, Jeff. Great, great to be in touch with you. A long time no see. Uh, thanks for the question. The answer is both. It's got two timelines, uh, contemporary and historical. All right. Thanks much. And, and Jeff, thanks for uh, thanks for coming today. Alice, I'm going to turn it over to you and thank you for hosting us. Thanks. Thanks. This was wonderful. I'm looking forward to diving back into my copy of Who Done It and uh, getting a copy of The Life of Crime and some of your other books. And uh, I think you've really conveyed, I think even in our small zoomy way, I think we have captured some of the feeling that you're talking about, about the CWA. I certainly feel like that's right. the aura of it that has attracted me to it. Uh, as a whole separate activity from some of the other organizations that I belong to. I, I really do feel like it's a very special community. And we're so honored to be part of it over here on the other side of the pond. Well, <laughs> so, I'm, I'm so glad you are. Thank you again for coming. And thank you, Art, for a wonderful interview.